Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, baseball fans and fans of the IBL, and welcome back and welcome to episode two here of IBL on deck for May 26th. I am Noah Smith. Join beside me, Dylan Baker, and right below me here on your screen, Ryan Eakin from Barry. And uh, a very exciting show for us coming up today, gentlemen. Two very good guests. We have great guests coming on the show today. It's Cleveland Brownlee, a longtime London major, the longest tenured major on the roster. Uh, last season will be joining the show as well as Guelph Royals manager Dino Rumel, who spent some time with the organization in the 1990s, came back. I'm very excited for this one. Ryan, it's your first time joining us here. Spencer is out this week. He has prior commitments. Uh, welcome to the show. It's great to have you along and great to bring in someone from another market. Yeah, and I think this is something that's great for the league. I mean, going back to when I started back in 2013, there was nothing like this. So I think this is great for the fans in this league. Going back two weeks ago to our uh, first ever episode of IBL On Deck, we brought on Commissioner John Kastner as well as Justin Gideon from Hamilton. Uh, two very good guests, and we got to talk a whole lot about um, almost everything revol revolving around the league. We talked about expansion. We talked about time in the league for Justin. It was really a great uh, avenue for fans to get to see players and the commissioner as well. Yeah, and you know what? The commissioner touched on expansion right away. That was one of the big things that was talked about throughout the episode. And then we really got to know Justin as a player and as a person, his play style uh, on the field and how he works so very hard in order to get results for his team. So I believe yeah. without further ado, Ryan, uh, sorry to cut you off there. I believe we are ready to bring in Mr. Cleveland Brownlee, um, our first guest here on episode number two. Cleveland, how are you doing today? Good, guys. How's it going? Not too bad. Now let's dive right into things. Cleveland, uh, you came over in 2010 as an import player to the majors from Atlanta. What has kept you coming back every year? You know, one of the and things that's always kept me coming back was, uh, you know, I enjoy the league and then we have the best fans in the league. So London has always been a great place. And you know what? That was the number one reason me coming back. Yeah, in Cleveland, um, just speaking from the Bay Cats perspective, I know when you come up to the Bay Cats, Mike Clark, our PA announcer, always likes to call your name. Just what have your relationships been like with guys across the league? You know, I, I've, I've gained a good relationship with a lot of the guys. Like I said, I've visited a lot of the ballparks over these years. And, you know, a lot of people know me now, so I like to kid around with the guys and, you know, I have the announcers say my names in certain different ways and, you know, things like that, just to draw more fans out. Being in the league for as long as you have, Cleveland, uh, like the other two have touched on, you get to grow these relationships with not only other players, but other fans and everyone involved in the league. How important is that to you when you go out to the ballpark and you just get to laugh and have some jokes with some people in the seats? You know, that's one of the main things that, that keeps us going back out there. Like I say, as long as you can build that relationship and everybody knows things in life revolve around relationships. So long as you can keep those good relationships going, it makes it fun when you go out to that ballpark. Even if you have the worst day, worst game of your life, it's still fun going out there, talking to people, cracking jokes and just having fun out there with the guys. You know, no one I know this firsthand. Cleveland Brownlee has become a well-known name throughout the city of London. What's your experience been like in the city with all the fans around town? You know what? The fans have treated me well. It's almost like one big family here. So, you know, I walk around town, people know me and, you know, I love it. That's one of the, like I said, that's one of the things that kept me coming back here. I love London fans. When you first joined the IBL, what was your first impression of the league? You know, I, I really didn't know anything about the league. When I came here in uh, 2010, I was just getting released from uh, independent ball, and I came here. And you know what? It was a lot of players. Back then, you had a lot of the older guys playing. Um, I came in when that era of Bradford was really good, and they were blowing all teams up. So you got to play against a lot of those guys that some of them had played in the big leagues. And, you know, Paul, Paul Jarrett was still in the league then, things like that. So I was one of those young guys that came in that, you know what, I really didn't know what to think, but it surprised me. And then, you know, unfortunately, I was enough to lead the league that year in home runs my first year here. But you know what? I never took this league for doubt at any point. Now, being in the league for 10 years, you talked about home runs. You have some milestones there. Probably one of the biggest accomplishments for you was being named to the IBL Top 100. What was that like? You know what? That was uh, that was great for me. You know, I can always tell people I never made it to the to the major leagues or the big leagues, anything. But to me, this was the next step. Being named as one of the top 100 players of all times, and a lot of great kids that came through this league. And you know, a lot of them, like they played in the pros. A lot of them are still coming, and a lot of them are still playing now in the league now. So having my name mentioned amongst those guys, yeah, it was a big accomplishment. 
That's a well-deserved honor for you, Cleveland. And last season on Canada Day, you hit your 100th career home run in the IBL. What was that like for you? Walk us through that experience being at the ballpark. It's packed. It's a beautiful day. How did that happen? Well, you know, it's even better today, Dylan, because we got a Barry Baycat fan on the online with us, so it's even better now. So, uh, no, you know what? I, I, I always tell people, you close your eyes and you swing hard and see how far the ball goes. So, you know, to hit one of those home runs, like I said, a milestone home run, and uh, a packed part like that, you know, it's a feeling like no other. Yeah, I might have threw the bat real high and walked halfway down the line, but, you know, it was caught in the moment, and that's just something you do, you know. It was for the fans. How much does uh, winning a championship weigh on your mind when it comes to you wanting to go out on top? Um, that's a great question coming from a Barry guy. Yeah. Yeah. No, um, you know what? I always tell people it's almost like I feel like a, almost like a Charles Barkley or something. You know, you've been in the league, people respect you, but you haven't won that championship yet. You know what? We've gotten close, and you know what? Root puts together a great team every year. And uh, we always get there. And, you know, it's just getting over that last little hump of making it to the finals. That would be a great thing to go out with if we could win a championship. Like I say, it's coming. One day it is coming to London. And, and the guys, you know what, we've all stuck together and played our, our hearts out. And, you know, what, it's all about timing and things like that. Baseball is a funny game. You know what, you can win one day and lose the next. And the good thing about baseball, you wake up to play another day. So, you know, it's going to come to London, and um, we just got to wait our time and keep putting in the work. With all that's going on right now, Cleveland, it's tough to get out and uh, stay in the baseball shape. What have you been doing to, you know, kind of just keep baseball on your mind a little bit? Uh, you know what? I do go back and watch some of the old games and stuff online. And, you know, I still talk to a lot of the guys on our team around here. And I got a four year old son. We go out in the yard and we throw the ball, things like that. You know what? During this time, it is hard. I know everybody misses baseball, misses sports. Like I say, our, our main goal now is to make sure everybody in the world is, is safe and, and healthy. And, you know, we will get that chance to come back out there. And I think the sports are going to come back stronger than ever this time. That's awesome. And uh, Cleveland, you've been around the, the league and you've been with the majors for almost 10 years now. I think this would have been your 10th season, if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. last year was. How has your role on the roster and with the team changed throughout the years? You know what? I'm the oldest guy on the team now. So, uh, you know, I still try to compete with those young guys. Um, I came in as an outfielder. You know, now I'm more of a DH and, you know, I help group do a lot of the coaching and, and guidance for the guys. We always get in a lot of young guys and we get them from all around the world. So, you know what? I try to throw in my little two cents of experience that I have. And, you know, I just try to mold those guys and, and build a stronger, stronger team there. And, you know, like I say, my role is to entertain the fans, try and try our best every time we get on the field. And, you know, I always tell the guys, go out there, play hard, smile. Whether you have the best game or you have the worst game, you know what, kids are looking up to you. So go out there and just have fun. Cleveland, you, when you came into this league, the first top teams in this league were always the best teams. But if you look at this season, maybe now into 2021, there's a lot of teams in this league that can come into the season with the hopes of winning the championship. How different is a league now than it was when you first came in? You know, that's good. Um, when I first came in, you know, you always had those guys that were on top. You always had your, uh, your brand first that everybody, you know what, you woke up that weekend just to go play against uh, your Lee Delfinos and, and uh, people like that on Bradford's team. Then you had uh, Barry was still up and coming and uh, you had your Guelph doing really good. And then also Kitchener was a real strong team. So you look at those teams and over the years it has changed around, but I always tell people over these last two years, everybody has gotten better. There is no guarantee guaranteed who's going to win first place, things like that. Um, you know, it's fortunate enough that we are able to bring in those imports. And like I say, those imports, they do change the aspect of the game a little, you know, especially some of those pitchers. Just look at last year, you're facing guys that played in the big league. That does change the aspect of the game, which which is great, you know. So, no, you know, I was really looking forward to this season. Hopefully we still do get back out there because I see some of the signings, such as a Hamilton or – Something like that. Those guys, you know what? You can't count those guys out. They, they did some good signings again this year. They were looking to be at the top of the pack again. And, um, yeah, you know, the league has changed. We It was a hitter's league at one time. Now, I'll tell anybody, you got to come ready to play because you're going to face the top pitcher for, you know, nine innings now. You know, so, yeah, it has changed and it's changed for the better. Talking a little bit about import players, you were once an import player coming uh, over from Georgia. How do you help the new guys on the team that are maybe seeing London for the first time or getting to Canada for the first time in their lives? 
You know, I always tell people when you come to London, you, you just gotta, it's almost like uh, it was a dream for me. I came here, you know, I came from a big city of Atlanta, but you know, it took, I, I, I love this city. So when you can walk around, there's no crime, there's things like that. I always tell the guys when you come in, enjoy the city, enjoy the people. Because if you come out there, you play your hardest, they'll open up their arms to you in the city. You can walk around and, and you meet everybody. There's a lot of things to do here. I always tell imports, man, enjoy this time because, you know, we all come from either smaller countries or we come back from, you know, smaller places such as Atlanta or they come from Dominican Republic. Things are not as good over there as they are here. So don't take this league or, you know, then they become a these teams from Grant. That's great. And Cleveland, you've been around for a long time. Besides your home ballpark of Labatt Park, do you have a favorite place to play in the league? Um, I like going to Kitchener to play just because of the home runs that I hit there, man. They just look like milestones there. And then the fans, they always boo me. So it makes it even better when I hit a home run there. Yeah, and you mentioned uh, hitting home runs out uh, with the Panthers. Um, Christie Pitts is always an interesting park because of how small it is. But just talking to some of the guys over the seasons, they always say it's, it's kind of a catch-22 because you always think about hitting home runs in Christie Pitts. Just what have your experiences been like playing at Christie Pitts? You know what? I always have uh, – Christie Pitts is a funny part to play. And like you say, some days you can go there and the ball just flies. Then other days you go there and then you can't get the ball and go out the infield. Um, over the last couple of years, you know what? I've had great chances at, uh, at Christie Pitts. I think last year I hit three of them there in one game. So, you know what? It's, it's just all about timing. That is another place that I do like to play just because, you know what, it, it's a great atmosphere. Those fans, they sit around and, you know what, they chirp you the whole time sitting on the hill and it's, it's hot as hell sitting in the middle of that field. And I love it, though. Yeah, the Christy Pitts Hill side, uh, not too welcoming sometimes, but very welcoming on other sides. We do have a question from a fan, Cleveland. Uh, Patrick Casey wants to know if Cleveland Jr. is faster than you already. <laughs> yeah, he's getting there, old uh, Coach Pat. No, Coach Pat went over to Hamilton. You know, Pat's a great guy. He started out with London with us. Now he's over at Hamilton. Yeah, so, you know, I got my son out there. He's running with me every day. Well, Cleveland's not. Well, I'm not running, but he's running. And, uh, no, different things like that. You know, that's one of the things that keeps me coming back to the game. So the, one day my son can see me play out there. Cleveland Jr., one of the one of the nicest faces to see at the ballpark on a nice summer day at Labatt. Um, now, you touched on a little bit earlier how the pitchers are constantly changing. They're getting better and better as the years progress. You said it's not as much of a hitter's league anymore as it once was. What adjustments have you had to make in order to continue your success in the IBL? Um, you know what? I, I've had to learn how to get the curveball a little bit better. And, you know, I always tell people, you throw a good curveball, you still can get me swinging at it, but you better make sure it's good. Because if you don't, then you know what? I got a better chance at it. I always tell people that you got great catchers in the league, too. And I always mention this guy, uh, Kyle DeGrace. Kyle DeGrace is one of the best catchers I've seen ever play in this league. And he was always one that he watched every batter that came up. And, you know what? He, he knew your weakness. And he wouldn't just give in like some of the other catchers. I always tell a lot of people in this league they have pride when they try to face me especially some of the younger pitchers and everything and they think they can just throw throw a ball past me you know like i'm one of the older guys now so i'm waiting on that fastball to come in you know different things like that so you have had to make adjustments and then you get some of those big league pitchers and you know what they, they've seen people like me and, and sean riley's come to the league and, and they're gonna throw any and everything at you. Yeah, and you mentioned about pitchers in this league. What have been some of the tougher pitchers that you have faced over the last decade? Um, you know what? I'm still going to say the guy for uh, the Panthers. He didn't play last year. Um, uh, Latenza. Latenza, yeah. I'm going to say he, he's one of the best pitchers I've seen in this league. He, he can throw from the side and he can come back over top with anything he wants to. So that was always one guy that I battled with. I think I might have two hits on him like out of those four years he was here. Awesome. Well, uh, we're running out of time here at Cleveland. We have to get to our second guest. Uh, we thank you very much for joining us today. It was a pleasure to talk to you. No problem. Thanks a lot, guys. That was Cleveland Brownlee from the London Majors, an IBL Top 100 player, and uh, our first guest on today's episode of IBL On Deck. I'm Noah Smith, Dylan Baker, and Ryan Eakin with me. Gentlemen, uh, a good first guest for us today. Fantastic first guest. Cleveland's one of the most entertaining guys around the league, and uh, he showed us exactly why in this conversation, making us laugh, keeping us on the edges of our seats uh, in some of the stories he told. A great first guest in today's episode. Yeah, and I, I've never talked to Cleveland up until now, but you always hear that he's always a big-time fan favorite, and that was a great conversation for sure. 
Cleveland Brownlee, uh, a guy that people in London are hoping is going to be back for another season and hopefully more and around the league, maybe not so much. So we'll have to see if Cleveland uh, will be back for another season. Um, Dylan, me and you got to see a whole lot of Cleveland this past season. Ryan, you mentioned it was the first time you got to chat with him, though. These are the type of players in the IBL that get the fans engaged and really make baseball and a day at the park a whole lot more fun. Yeah, and guys like Cleveland are exactly why fans keep coming back to to whether it's Labatt Park, Welland Stadium, Coast Stadium, and Barry, whatever it may be. Cleveland is a talented player, but he makes sure to stay engaged with the fans, to talk to them, to share stories with them, to make sure they have a personal connection to the players as well. And and if we have a lot of players like him, it really benefits the league. Yeah, and as Dylan just said, you know, connecting with play, uh, fans across the league. You think of Glenn Jackson, Sean Riley, a lot of these veteran IBL players, they really take that and they really think it's important moving forward for this league. So that was our first guest on uh, today's episode. I believe we are ready for our second guest to be joining us here, uh, Mr. Dino Rumel from uh, the Guelph Royals. How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing great. appreciate you having me on, fellas. And, uh, you know, it's an honor to be on with uh, Cleveland as well. I remember as a little kid watching him play with the London Majors. Uh, I'm kidding. Not that long. But he's been in the league. He's done such a great job. He's a great uh, spokesman for the league and uh, you know I, I, and a great competitor so it's good to see him back with the majors again this year yeah always great to talk to Cleveland we're very excited to get a chance to chat with you as well Dino you coached the Guelph Royals in the 1990s winning the league in 1993 what was that what was that experience like for you well I'll tell you we hadn't won in a lot of years it was a, a few decades before uh, since we had won and uh, my first year was 92 we, we made it to game seven of the uh, championship series and lost on a controversial play. And uh, then the next year we won, we beat Toronto in six games. And uh, I mean, the whole city was amazing. We we were drawing great every night. Uh, there was so much electricity in the stadium. I remember to tell you the truth, I, I used to go to the ballpark early for a jog in the, in the afternoon. And, and there are people lining up their lawn chairs for good seats at one o'clock for a 7.30 game for playoff game. So uh, the buzz was great. Um, 94, we made it to game seven again. and blew a seven run lead in the ninth inning. So we lost, uh, we had an opportunity to win three championships in a row. We had a good run, some great players. Uh, you know, Eric Lasky, one of the best players I've ever seen in this league in the top 100 as well, Kevin Hinton, and probably one of the smartest players I've ever been around, Sean Travers, who did make the top 100 for some reason, uh, but he's had five championships in this league. So we had a number of really outstanding players uh, in this team and, and on this team. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a treat for me to be back in my hometown. Yeah, you mentioned coming back to your hometown. Uh, why was the decision now to come back to the IBL after leaving for a bit? Well, I'll tell you, I was in Toronto. Uh, we won a championship in 07, and then I coached in Barry. I've also managed in Oshawa, so when the, the Dodgers were in town. So I've got uh, quite a collection of uniforms in this league. I have such a passion for this league. I, I loved it. I was heavily involved with the Ontario Blue Jays for a number of years, but this is where my heart's always been. Um, and the uh, competition that, and, and what they've done with this league, John Kastner and the owners in this league have been so, been unbelievable as far as putting this product together so it was a no-brainer uh when i heard tipo uh wasn't going to come back he decided to spend a little more time with his family and he had done such a great job setting things up for me uh it was a no-brainer you know i lived three minutes from the ballpark um, my restaurant is uh, a one minute drive from the, the ballpark and and uh you know again it gives me an opportunity to do something i love you talked a little bit about the competitiveness. How has that changed from your time in the 90s to what you see on the field today in the IBL? Well, I'll tell you, I think it's uh, it's different. I think the one thing that I will say is the pitching uh, with the guys that we're getting in the league, we, we, it was very rare to see guys throwing 94, 95. Um, had the season started on time, uh, three of our imports threw 95 or better um, that we were bringing in. And, uh, and we made a big trade for... Uh, for Julian Higuera from London, uh, and he led the league in strikeouts. So the quality of pitching top to bottom, I think, is so much better than it was in the 90s. But we had some real competitors. It was just a, it was a great caliber of baseball back then and great excitement. Now, again, I've seen it this 30 years I've been around the league. It's, uh, it, it, it hasn't changed from a competitive standpoint, but just the level and the consistency in the pitching has. 
And I think that's that's been great. I think, again, uh, what I was saying earlier about what John Castor has done and with the owners in this league, the way that they've promoted the league is a lot better. Uh, teams like Welland, uh, Barry, Kitchener. I mean, I've been to the ballpark and they've drawn so well. Everybody looks like they're on the same page, whereas in the 90s, owners were in it for themselves and you didn't have that kind of unity as an organ, you know, as a whole organization in the inner county. And the, the message wasn't clear amongst all the teams. Now it's a clear message. Everybody's on the same page. Everybody wants to put the best product on the field. And it's, you know, you're, you're in for a battle every single night. It's, it's, a, it's an amazing, uh, amazing league. Yeah, you talked about the unity amongst owners and, and the commissioner as well there, which helps the league, as you mentioned. Talking about unity with players, you said when you got hired, one of the big things for you was uh, making sure that everyone plays for the team and they are really close. How important is team camaraderie in the team's success? Well, you know, it's always been for me. I mean, that's, that's the one thing that I would say is my strength. Uh, in building a in building an organization, and, and I've been around the Atlanta Falcons for for 13 years. My, my closest friend's a general manager down there, and, and something that Dan Quinn has said, which uh, I, I think I'd love to use, it, he wants to build a, a brotherhood rather than a neighborhood in in the locker room. And I think that's so important to use something like that. It's always been winning in the locker room first translates into success on the field. And you look at the teams that I've won championships with, I've been fortunate enough to be around. I've always been close with the guys. I keep in contact with the guys from the 90s, um, friends with the guys from Brantford uh, when we won a few years ago. And the Toronto guys I love, um, I, have a, I have a bond with all those guys. So I think it's really important that you win in the locker room. You see it, Ryan in, in Barry, the, the closest that that team has. And, and I think that was very responsible for what what happened on the field. So I'm a true believer of that. So when you talk about unity, again, you want to build a brotherhood, not a neighborhood where it's guys just walking in saying, hey, what's up, go on the field. Now, you want guys to fight for each other. And I think that's so important about uh, looking at it from that perspective when you're team building. Yeah, and I was going to ask you about the Baycats. I know that you have a great relationships with Kyle DeGrace, Chris Nagorski, and a few of the OBJ guys. Just how nice was it to see them have the success that they have had over the last six seasons? Well, it was great because I wasn't in the league against them. <laughs> uh, Kyle, in my mind, is, is the best catcher I've ever seen in this league. Um, he just controls the tempo. Uh, he's he's a very, very close friend of mine. Same with Chris. Uh, Goose is, a, I think, an outstanding manager and a great pitcher when he was in the league. Top to bottom, I mean, Spatero, all those guys. Jordan Castaldo, um, I love it. I mean, there's a closeness I have with a lot of those guys. And again, uh, you know, when you look at Kevin Atkinson, too, I can go right down the list of guys that I, I have so much respect for as baseball players. But I think even more importantly, guys like even like Stevie Lewis, guys that, that I love off the field. I think it's, it, it was so nice to see them be successful. But now it's, uh, it's time for the Guelph Royals. You mentioned uh, spending time in the OBJ organization. Um, do the relationships that you built there help when it comes to recruiting some Canadian talent for your Guelph team? Uh, no question. I think that, uh, again, when I, when I talk about trying to team build, uh, you know, there's a closeness that I have, and it's, it, it, and it's very sincere. And I love the players that I coach. I always have. So when you have a chance to develop players when they're 16, 17, and 18 and see them move on, uh, I think there's a, there's a bond there. And, and I've heard from a lot of players uh, when I got the job here in Guelph about coming here. So I think it does. I think it adds a lot to it. And uh, I think the one thing is, obviously, the travel. Um, when you're living in Oshawa or Pickering to come to Guelph, it's a very difficult situation. So that adds a different dynamic to it. Uh, however, people around here, I, uh, you know, there's there's certain aspects of games of certain players that I know and uh, I would love to have here uh, with me in Guelph uh, and take that next step after uh, college or whenever their pro career ends. So you have been a big part of the OBJ organization for years, as we've mentioned. Um, how does that benefit you in recruiting players? Well, again, uh, it all comes down to the bond and the trust that you have with players. Um, knowing that I have their best interest at heart. Um, I think uh, a lot of these guys understand that. And uh, again, when you when you see the development as a kid, as you get into, into this type of surrounding and you're grown up and you're, you know, you've, you've had your run with professional baseball, college baseball, you know that still you go to a guy that, that loves and respects your game and, and, uh, 
and wants the best for you. So I think that that's going to help in recruiting, I believe, here in Guelph. And also, I have some great people helping me, you know, whether it be uh, Sean, Sean Travers or or other guys around the uh, the Ontario Blue Jays organization that that uh, that have been with the organization or are still with the organization that uh, that I've created bonds with that will help me as far as you know talking to players. Yeah, and you mentioned the OBJs, and you brought in a couple guys from the Bay Cats this past offseason that have connections to the OBJs, Darren Shred being one of them. Just what do you expect from those two guys that you brought in, both Shred and Connor Morrow? Two guys that I that I'm crazy about. I, you know, Con- Connor Morrow. Uh, from the time I saw him as a 16 year old, I, I I've been a huge fan of his game. The hard nose. He has such a great feel for the game. He is just a baseball player. If you love the game of baseball, you will love to watch Connor Morrow play. One of my all time favorites uh, as far as the, the type of game that he has. Darren Shred uh, started out as a catcher with the Ontario Blue Jays. Uh, but he is just such a competitor, a great guy in the locker room. He's a lot of fun. Um, you know, again, two guys that I that I that I love off the field as much as I love watching them play. Uh, so it was a no-brainer for me to go after them and 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 try and get them to come here. And and uh, you know, when when we worked out the deal, I was very very excited, and I believe they are too. And they're going to be cornerstones of this team. Darren uh, as our you know potential closer and Connor is our shortstop and uh, you know I'm, I'm, I'm very fired up about having him here. One of the things we like to ask some of the players when they come on with us on the show are how they are keeping themselves ready for baseball during these times. What exactly goes through the mind of a manager though? You were getting your team ready for baseball just two months ago. Now you don't know when that's going to be. Well, it's funny. I, you know, I met with a couple of guys the other night. And that's the one thing I keep saying to uh, to them and to uh, to Sean Fuller. And I have to say that Sean Fuller, the owner of the uh, the Guelph Royals, is uh, has been such a great partner in all of this and trying to get me uh, started up here. Uh, and, and one of the reasons why I came uh, took the job in Guelph was because of his competitive drive and wanting to win. I think what what happens is you have to be ready because we don't know. Uh, if we're going to be on the field in the first week of July yet. So it's, uh, you know, right now, I think the, the feelers have to be out there to see if guys still want to play. Um, there's opportunities with a kind of a disbursement um, of the teams that aren't in the league. Uh, they, they may have an opportunity to join teams that are playing for a one-year deal and then go back to their organization so they don't miss out on a year playing baseball. So there are a lot of things working, but this is really, for me, it's a 12-month-a-year job. I mean, I, I'm always on the phone with people, and I'm always trying to make this team better. And, and again, with the help of Sean Fuller and, uh, and guys like Sean Riley and Justin Terrasano, I think uh, my job's a lot easier. That's for sure. Now, you know, the Guelph Royals are one of five IBL teams that are holding out hope for a season. Let's say, as you mentioned, we're back on the field's first week of July and uh, the IBL is able to, to have a season uh, get going. Does your message change to players? That's a great question, Dylan. I think the one thing is, um, for me as a person, and what I want to relate to a lot of guys is, uh, you know, I, I'm such a crazy competitor. I hated losing at crazy eights to my little girls. I mean, it used to drive me crazy. So I, I think to get on the field, anytime you're on the field, I judge players by instead of you know uh, a 60 yard dash or or how they hit. I char- I, I, I like to grade people on competitiveness and toughness. So anytime you step on the field, you want to be the best at what you do. So regardless if it's five teams or eight teams, I think it's really important that every time you step on the field, you want to compete. And that's the message we want to send. You mentioned Sean Riley and Turner Santo and a few other guys. Um, how nice would it be to see those guys go out with a championship? Because I know at this point, Riley's pretty much season to season. So how nice is it would it be to see him go out on top? Uh, you know what? I know we talked about Sean had a had an opportunity to win a championship in 04. Uh, Justin has been a, a great uh, a great member of this organization, uh, and that that was really the, you know one of the selling points when I met with Sean um, uh, Sean Fuller. He uh, got me to talk to Justin and, and uh, Sean Riley, and I've known Sean. I, I coached Guelph as an assistant a couple years ago, a few years ago, but I've I have so much respect for what they've done to this organization or for this organization. And they've taken such a great leadership role. I mean, that's one thing. I I really want to have an opportunity to go out and and win a championship for those guys because they put so much heart and soul into this organization. And they deserve to go out champions. 
All right, we have time for just a few more questions, Dino. I'm going to try and switch gears a little bit here. Last episode with Commissioner John Kastner, we talked a lot about league expansion. Uh, with your time in the 90s and throughout the decade, you mentioned almost 30 years in the league, um, there's been tons of teams coming through. Where is one place you would like to see baseball back in the IBL? Well, there's, uh, you know, obviously, I think geographically, if you have a place, say, out, uh, you know, it's too bad it didn't work out in Oshawa, though I hated that drive. I mean, imagine Guelph to Oshawa for every home game. Um, you know, to see a, a, if, if John's and, and the owner's ideas come to fruition, uh, my understanding is they would like to start in two divisions, or at least that's what John was saying last week when I watched the show. Uh, so it'd be great to have a team out east. And if you can get something in the Sarnia, Chatham, St. Thomas, you know, maybe not as far as Windsor, but get something in the West End and have a West and East division. I think that would work out great. That way you avoid the London to Barry, uh, you know, Thursday night game and the, the stress that it puts on guys getting off work and then heading over. So if you could do that, I think this would be great, but it's got to be the right situation. I mean, there's got to be guys that are serious about getting in here, serious about building a competitive franchise. And I think this league is, is just going to blow up. I mean, this is what, what you see what Welland has done and uh, the atmosphere there you see what's happening in Barrie and in you know in London's always been outstanding but all the craziness in Toronto and Kitchener the buzz around there and I think as we continue to win here in Guelph and the product get, keeps getting better you're going to see the crowds here be great so every ballpark you're going to go to it's going to be like a, a professional atmosphere but the great part about it it's, it's still such a community event and I think that's going to be important to maintain that. Now, what do you think an East and West division brings to fan interest? Because like you mentioned, we'll see less trips for, for London going to Barrie, for example. How do you think that draws more fans in or it may impact the fan presence at uh, interdivision games? Well, I'll tell you, I think the, the, the one thing for me is you, de you develop these rivalries in your division, but you still get an opportunity, hopefully with the crossover games, to play you know, Toronto two or four times or play Barrie two or four times a year. I don't know how they would set it up. I think it's such a great idea, but I'd like to see the logistics of it. But I think it would develop these great rivalries in your division, and then you know you branch off and have an opportunity to meet the other division in the playoffs. I think that would be great and create these outstanding local rivalries between fans. You know, I was a sportscaster for 18 years. I did worked in the Ontario Hockey League, and the and the the rivalry between the Guelph Storm or Guelph Platers and the Kitchener Rangers was so great. You had fans going back and forth, and I think you're going to see that if we have a, an opportunity to develop these rivalries rivalries in a division uh, division by division standpoint so I think it's going to be a great situation and I have a lot of faith in the in, in our commissioner and, and the ownership groups and uh, and, the, and the vision that they have for this league because they've done such a great job building it to where it is right now yeah and you mentioned uh, how much you know some teams have great battles against each other uh, back in the early 2000s I guess there was a lot of Toronto against anyone you know Panthers Royals what were some of your favorite battles over the last couple decades well, when I was with Toronto, uh, obviously Barry, uh, sorry, uh, Brantford was was a huge rivalry for us. We always finished one two in the in the years that I was there, and uh, it was just before Brantford got on that big run. Uh, we had an opportunity to beat them, um, and it kind of split up their their uh, dynasty. Um, in Guelph, we always had a rivalry in the '90s with Kitchener Panthers, um, and still do. And I, locally, I think uh, in in. Brantford, uh, Barry was a, a big rival, and we had such an outstanding playoff series. The final year before Barry went on this run, we came back from a three nothing deficit and won four straight to win the championship. Sorry, Kyle DeGrace, but that message is out for you. Um, but no, it was uh, it was a uh, you know there are so many great rivalries in this league, and now again, Welland and Hamilton with the youth that they have and the type of baseball that they bring, I think that's going to be a, a, a natural rivalry. Um, you know, London was, uh, we, you know, my first few years, it was always us in London in the first round and developed a, a great rivalry that way. So you do get these rivalries and, and the players knowing each other and being around this league, I think uh, it creates even more of a, a great feel and go to the ballpark and compete. Well, Dino, I know we'd love to sit here and talk all day long about baseball, but we are out of time. Uh, we'd like to thank you for joining us today. It was really fantastic to talk to you. Guys, I really appreciate it. And listen, thank you. I, I'm I'm, big, I'm a big fan of this show. I, I love what you guys are doing, and not only here, but the play-by-play -play stuff you do, and the and the you know the, the work that you've done promoting this league. I think it's great. I really appreciate what you've done. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Dino.
That was Dino Rumel over from Guelph. Uh, gentlemen, a fantastic talk for us there. And I think it's safe to say that the Guelph Royals are in good hands. Yeah, I would say that's a pretty uh, pretty safe statement. Dino's such a fascinating guy. You know, his approach to coaching was very interesting and how much he, he really enjoys the community and uh, the stories he was able to tell. Really a great interview with him. Yeah, if you go back to last week, the IBL posted a players poll and they were asked in one of the questions if you could pick one team to go play with, it, it would be Guelph. And I think that's clearly why I think Dino's a great guy and he's going to be a great coach moving forward for Guelph. Well, that was Dino from the Guelph Royals, and that will do it for our second episode of IBL On Deck. Uh, make sure you join us in two weeks' time. We are bi-weekly as of right now for this show. June 9th will be our next episode live at 4 o'clock. Um, from Ryan Eakin, Dylan Baker, Spencer can be here today. I'm Noah Smith, and we thank you for watching IBL On Deck.